Hello and welcome back to another brand new video where once again I am discussing Doctor Who. This time I'm talking about uh, the fact that Series 3 of the revival of Doctor Who is very forgettable. I just finished my rewatch of it as I'm recording this and even as I'm as I was rewatching it, it was kind of forgettable in a way. So let me explain. With um, all of Doctor Who, Series 3 is the one season I don't return to all that often. I think the most I'll ever return to is the Human Nature and the Family of Blood episode, Blink, and the Master three-parter. Odd times uh, Daleks in Manhattan uh, would be another one, that two-parter would be another one that I would return to. All the other episodes, not really. And again, there's a few episodes in here that I haven't seen since it first aired, uh, being The Lazarus Experiment and 42. And I believe The Shakespeare Code. I'm not one, I think I've returned to that a few, uh, once or twice, but it, not in full. Um, so yeah, I suppose we will get started with the beginning of the the series with Smith and Jones. Um, our first introduction to Martha Jones, who the actress Freema Adjaman uh, was last seen in the uh, Army of Ghosts and Doomsday episode, which does get reference in this one that it was a cousin uh, of Martha uh, that was in the Battle of Canary Wharf and obviously died. Um, and it's basically the her hospital, as she's a med, med student, gets pulled up to the moon and we get to see the Jadoon uh, for the first time. And uh, they're hunting for someone who essentially drinks blood and uh, can trick the Jadoon scanners into thinking she's a member of that species. Uh, in this case, it's um, humans. So uh some shenanigans happen and uh, they, they end up finding her and kill her and then bring everyone back and so the doctor decides because martha uh saved him uh she gets one trip in the tardis and so as the first trip it's to see shakespeare so now we're moving into the shakespeare code which is an episode that I've maybe haven't returned to in full since it first aired 16 years ago, back in 2007. And it was okay. Like with Smith & Jones, it was okay. It's uh, a decent enough story evolving one of the uh, lost plays of Shakespeare. And uh, also involves uh, witches known as the uh, Carrionites. And it's... You know, your average run-of-the-mill episode. Definitely one of the lines doesn't hold up uh, all these years later. Um, when the Doctor basically says, good old JK. Uh, for JK Rowling. But, um, yeah, see, the funny thing about this episode was originally it was supposed to be centered around JK Rowling, I believe. Uh, if I If memory serves me correct from what I've heard about what this episode was supposed to be, uh, but she turned it down. Uh, it was originally going to be about just before the she publishes the the first Harry Potter book, and there's going to be this entity like thing, kind of like the Dementors from Prisoners of Azkaban, and that was then going to give her influence for them in Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm hoping I'm remembering that correctly. If someone knows what I'm talking about, please do put that in the comments down below so yeah uh first two episodes pretty decent uh next is gridlock which sees the return of the classic uh monsters the macra which hasn't been seen since i believe the second doctor uh story the macra terror which i've never seen before uh i haven't seen uh, well, when I say I, I've never seen before, I meant um, on about the, the Macro Terra. I've never seen that before, but I've obviously seen Gridlock. And I've 
flipped what I originally thought of this episode. Because as, as a kid, I thought it was okay. Not okay, but not the greatest episode. I mean, it's the last time we see we see the face of Bo. And um, it's also here where we uh, once again return to New, New New York. And we see the aftermath of the last time the Doctor was here. Um, with Rose, a series prior, and it's gone to shit. Um, basically, in order to save all the people in New New York, they uh, essentially, for 24 years, had them stuck in this motorway with uh, Macra uh, in uh, the bottom. And uh, it's, it's, you know, like I said, I, I changed my mind on this episode. Uh, I like it more than I did when I first watched it, when I first aired in 2007. And there was one character that the, the voice I could recognize because it's Irish. And I was like, I recognize this voice. Who the hell is it? And so as I was watching it, I looked it up. And lo and behold, it's the actor who plays Father Dougal Maguire in Father Ted. I was like, how is it? It had it basically was me looking him up to realize that that yeah that is Father Dougal Maguire um who plays Brannigan the cat person um but yeah you know I, I definitely have changed my mind on this episode and then of course after that we get the uh, Daleks in Manhattan two parter. So Daleks in Manhattan and the evolution of the Daleks is one that, once again, I kind of flip-flop on. Um, whereas when it first came out, I thought it was decent. Um, then, of course, later on, went out on a few rewatches, it's I hated it. You know, it's not the best Dalek story in the Russell T. Davis era, and it's definitely not the best Dalek story in all of Doctor Who. And then from this rewatch, you know, Going in with a fresh, fresher, open, more open-minded to actually give it a proper chance. It's good. I, I genuinely do like it. It's like I said, it's not the best Dalek story in the Russell era. It's more in the. It's definitely at the bottom of the list. Um, but it's it's decent. I do like it. Um, you know, we see a young Andrew Garfield in this. Um, and it's decent that there's not really much more I can really say on this one um other than it's it's decent it's not the best like I said it like I said it's it's at the very bottom but it's still a Dalek story that's okay at, at best it's 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 one that you don't necessarily need to return to much if you're re-watching all the Dalek episodes in from all of modern who especially from the Russell era or Russell era one, whichever way you want to refer to this, the, the first era of Russell. Um, so then next is the Lazarus experiment. And it, it was an episode that I haven't watched or watched in full since it first came out back in 2007. And it, I liked it better than I did when it first came out. Like when it first came out, I thought it was bad. Um, you know, it just wasn't, it didn't grip me as, uh, as a kid, whereas now when I look at it, I can actually, you know, pay more closer attention to the dialogue and how things are. It's okay. Does the CGI hold up for, for the Lazarus Scorpion? Absolutely not. But it's a good, it's not good, good. It's a, it's, it's okay. It's not bad. It's not great. It's all right, you know. Uh, for for a story, um, which does have you know later implications in the master three parter, and then I was just thinking actually when I was you know rewatching it, um, the mysterious man, which is what he's credited as in the episode, when he goes up to um, Martha's mother to inform him of the doctor, and that I was think originally I was thinking you know that should have been the master. You know, it should have been John Sims' master, but maybe he hadn't been casted at that point yet. Um, uh, or, and that, but that's what I initially thought until I, uh, before I recorded this, I sat and thought about it a bit more. I was like, hang on a second. In 
the end of time part one, we know that the master had a secret cult organization that, you know, knew of him, knew of the doctor and all that. So now that makes part to me, that makes perfect sense because that's how he, uh, that's how this person was able to inform Martha's mother about the doctor and hence why she got linked with, with Saxon, um, the master. Um, but yeah, now it's time for 42, which is a Chris Chibnall episode. And yeah, it's, I, I don't know how to, how I would describe it really. You know, it's not the best, it's not the worst that Chibnall has, has written, you know, that honor, I believe, goes to for uh, to Orphan Fifty Five. I I pretty I'm pretty sure he wrote that episode. Um, but yeah, it's it's not the best. Uh, you know, having the sun as as a living, breathing thing, not his best idea. Uh, that's that's for sure. But as an episode that has one main gimmick. And that is when they mention the the countdown, the countdown it coincides with the episode, ex excluding the ending and the beginning. From as soon as you see the countdown, to begin to when it ends is actually forty two minutes in length. So I think that's pretty neat. Uh, for for what he what Chimel tried to do with that episode, it's pretty neat. But um, you can definitely tell like it's one of those less cost effective episodes that they they done on like a very small budget out of the the whole greater um greater budget because you know there wasn't that many many um actors involved there was you know some cg scenes yeah but in total there i'd say there might have been like less than less than 15 um actors on of working in this episode because you know they you have Martha's mother coming back. You have someone from that works with Saxon, Harold Saxon. Um, but yeah, no, there, there's probably less than 15, 10 to 15 people on uh, working on this episode because, you know, some of them do get killed off. Uh, but it's, it's okay. Um, I don't hate it as much as I did when I first watched it. You know, as, as watching it, you know, trying to go in with, like I said, what I've done with a lot of these episodes that I haven't seen since uh, it first aired. I already have, like, an opinion on them. I, I try to go into these with a more open, more of an open mind. And it's not as bad. But, yeah, the first half, as I said, up until this point, um, in Series 3, Episode 7, is genuinely the most forgettable part of of the series because like I like I knew I know what happens in a lot of them. I could read the title and I could and I know what happens in the episode. But it it's forgettable in the fact that I don't return to them as often. Like um most of these episodes I'll either like except for like I said the Daleks in Manhattan, Evolution of the Daleks and from human nature onwards are episodes I return to the most all the others, as I said, two of them didn't even come back to for 16 years. And uh, it's just that they're like, they're okay. Like, um, it's definitely the second half of the season that uh, that somewhat saves, saves this season for me. Because those are such amazing episodes that I will get into after a brief little interlude. Okay, so breaking continuity here. Uh, I'm recording this just before I even finished my series three rewatch, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to record this as soon as I actually had the uh, finished it. So um, the technically first Doctor Who animated uh, story, well, from the David Tennant era is the Infinity Quest, Infinity Quest. And I kind of had no idea where I wanted to put this in the review because after watching it, you know, there's no real mention of Martha having just one trip and then 
being dropped back like she did in the vast majority of um, the, ep uh, the first six episodes until we get to the Lazarus experiment where she then becomes a full-time companion. So I'm actually, I actually watched this after I watched uh, 42, which is where I'm actually going to put it in timeline. Even though it's, te it would, it's technically not canon uh, per se, um, I still wanted to cover it. And I'll be doing the same with Dreamland when I get to the 2009 specials. Anyway, uh, so what did I think of Doctor Who The Infinity Quest? Because this is actually... This was actually my first time actually watching it. Now, I actually never knew this existed until I watched uh, a review by Har uh, Harbour Holmes, who reviews the individual episodes of the show um, over on his YouTube channel. And uh, so this was my first time sitting down watching it in full because I believe it was released for, it was released anyway for uh, the CBBC. So it was, I think it was, on the DVD it says totally Doctor Who on it, so it might be a release for that. But it was all right, you know, uh, as a story of how how things progressed uh, throughout the story, you know, uh, was really good. I loved how because of the animation form that we could see all these new places, all these new creatures that wouldn't necessarily translate well into live action you know for some of them you know with the giant mantises and and the the different um planets that they went to you know we have a desert planet we have a swampish planet we then have the um a snow planet and then we actually have where the uh the infinite rests and i don't think this episode would have looked well had it been in live action and you know it's there is a lot of things that i did not like about it you know such as it felt big finish to me um in a sense you know with the the way the doc uh david tennant and freema adjuman was how they were doing their voices yet it's basically just them doing doctor who and that but it didn't have the the certain deliveries that you'd expect, you know, if they have to run, there, there's not that correct delivery there with it. And um, but other than that, you know, like I said, it was all right. I actually really did like the, the art style that was used for this one. I much preferred the art style for the Infinite Quest over Dreamland, that's for sure. Um, but as a whole, it's okay. It's definitely not needed uh, for your rewatch or watch through of of the show i just watched it because i you know i have how i have my doctor who collection is i have them in timeline order so uh, that's how i'm watching through this show is timeline order for the modern series you know with series one series two series three slash infinite quest series four the specials with dreamland and series five and on so Back to the regular video. And back. So yeah, now we get on to the rest of the the season. Um, and we start off with Human Nature and Family of Blood. Now, last year I did do a top five favorite modern Doctor Who episodes. And this, uh, this two-parter was on that list. I believe it was number five. And after this rewatch of it, you know, having not rewatched it for... You know, a few years. It's been, it's been a while since I returned to this episode. I genuinely love it. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, it, it's definitely top tier modern Doctor Who episodes and a top tier David Tennant episode. My God, his acting in in Family of Blood with him, you know, uh, being John Smith, not wanting to be the Doctor again is amazing but i'm getting ahead of myself here because there's two things i need to mention about this two-parter um the first is this this two-parter was originally a seventh doctor book um that was released during the wilderness years you know after the show got cancelled before the tv movie this was one of those books that was released 
uh, in that time period. It was the Seven Doctor story. And the original author for that book came back for, for this two-part episode. And there's a Easter egg that I finally noticed um, on this rewatch of uh, when the Doctor and the Matron are walking and he goes to fix a Scarecrow. He mentions um, his mother and father, a Sydney and a Verity, and it clicked. That's a reference to Sydney Newman, the creator of the of Doctor Who, and Verity Lambert, the first producer of the show. And it only clicked at, because, like, after the um, the uh, an adventure in time and space, where I actually learned more about Sydney Newman and Verity Lambert that I didn't know when that short came out. So, just wanted to let let uh, bring that up. In case you know, there's there's some people who, like myself, only grew, uh, initially grew up with mo modern who that didn't know about the creator's name or the fir or Verity Lambert. Um, so yeah, and then of course you know, as I, as I stated, this is a fantastic episode from start to finish. It is jam packed, and it's it was one of my favorite episodes as a kid, and it still holds up to me. To this day, like as I was saying, when I was watching David Tennant acting in Family of Blood, when he, when you know, they were trying to force him to be the Doctor again, he, his, the way he he done the dialogue was amazing. Um, and I was watching the deleted scenes. There's a deleted scene that I wish they kept in. Um, it was between uh. Timothy and Hudgens, I believe. I knew you'd survive. Go away. You had to for the vision to come true. Stop talking like that. You told me. Here. Hold it. Just hold it. What can you hear? Nothing. I thought so. It's like it's just meant for me. I mean, if the watcher stayed where it was, we'd all be dead by now. It's like it knew. It wanted me to carry it. What for? You're right. I have been a coward. I was so scared of him. Now it's time for me to do my duty. Where are you going? Hutchinson in a few years will be fighting again, in the mud and the dark. Will you trust me? I don't know what you mean. Will you trust me? Yes. I wish they had kept that in because that would have that was I would have explained a bit more um to it if if you get me. And then of course after this episode was another um, light episode in terms of uh, actors and set pieces and that. And that is everybody's favorite episode, Blink. And it still holds up, but it's slightly, this is gonna get me crucified. It's slightly overrated to me now, you know, um, that I've watched it so many times that it's kind of, almost kind of lost that charm for me. But it's, again, it's one of those episodes that it's been a while since I watched it. And hell, I even I, I even remember having um, back in the day when some of the newspapers used to give you like singular episodes for free uh, with it. I remember getting the Blink one and I used to watch that all the time. And... Uh, uh, I, like it's I don't like I said it's a little it's a tad bit overrated to me now but it's still a fantastic episode and from from beginning to end with how that there you know there's not as I said it's it's a light episode to save on budget but it was done right and it's another amazing episode that Stephen Moffat had done before he took over as showrunner and kind of we'll get to that we're getting to that very very soon it's it'll take a it'll take two months but we'll we'll get to this to the Moffat era 
uh, that's that's for damn sure because I do have a lot of things to 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 say about those. Um, but yeah, you know, fantastic episode, tiny bit overrated. And now we get to the the three part episode, Utopia, the sound of drums, and the last of the Time Lords. Now, I love these episodes. Um, you know, Utopia, a fantastic start to to the uh, to the three parter. Fantastic start, you know, getting introduced to Professor Yana, the bringing Jack back, you know, um, for the first time since series one. Like we, I know he's had Torchwood and that, but it's the first time he's been brought back to the main show, and then, um, as well, you know, then. The whole how everything unfolds, you know, you, you you don't think it's going to be related to that, and then until you meet Professor Yana, who um whose initials basically spell out "You are not alone," which is the warning that the face of both gave the Doctor all the way back in season three, episode three. So uh, then it turns out, you know, after the Master opens the Fob Watch, that it's the War Master, the Master that fought during the Time War. And uh, he then escapes in the TARDIS after being shot by Chanto and regenerates into John Sims. And I, I still love John Sims' portrayal of the Master. Like, he, he's definitely not my absolute favorite iteration of the Master. Like, to me, it goes Roger Delgado, the original Master, and then Michelle Gomez, and then John Sims. Uh, but practically, I, I I love everyone who's portrayed the Master, except for Sha Sasha Dewan. I don't like his iteration of the Master. I still don't. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So, the sound of drums, the 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 next uh, the second part in this trilogy, is amazing from start to finish. You are on your toes. The Doctor, Martha, and Jack have to go into hiding because they are public enemy number one, two, and three. And basically, it's just showing, you know, with the master now being the prime minister of England, he can do whatever the fuck he wants. And um, then, of course, we learn what he's done with the TARDIS. He turned it into a paradox machine, which allows the Tocklefin, which is the, the last surviving humans from the end of time, to come back in these little balls yokes. And um, basically kill their, you know, the past humans. In order to keep that balance, we have the Paradox Machine. And then it ends with the Doctor being aged up and Martha on the run. And then we get to the last of the Time Lords. And this one is a lot, it's a very dis decisive uh, amongst fans. You know, a lot of people like it, a lot of people don't. And I like it up to a certain point. I think it's a really good episode up until a certain point. And that is when the Doctor goes Jesus mode, essentially. Uh, where he taps into the Archangel um, network. Uh, all these people are thinking about the Doctor, which then makes him, you know, magically go from the little gimp that he was all the way back up to uh, to his normal self. And then, of course... Time gets the timeline gets reverted. The master dies, dies. <gasps> Sorry for that hiccup. And Martha leaves. And we also find out that Captain Jack is the face of Bo, which never has never been brought up again uh, since that. So yeah, but Martha leaves, and it, it's sad because you know Martha is she's a really good companion. As I was growing up, I never liked Martha. I didn't like her, uh, uh, but now. You know, I've grown, as I've grown up, I've come to appreciate her more. She's a fantastic companion throughout the entire series. The only gripe that I have with her, and it's the, it's the same gripe that a lot of people have with her, and that is her falling in love with the Doctor. And as I was watching it, it did not make sense. Like, it happened so quickly. Like, I get, and probably, you know... If I think about it, it, it probably started, you know, in uh, Smith and Jones, you know, 
uh, with with the kiss and all that. But you know, she, in in the first two episodes, the first episode, ep, two episodes, she, she made it clear that she has n absolutely no feelings for the Doctor, and then by um, episode three and onwards, suddenly she has these feelings for the Doctor. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, whereas with Rose, it was built up over time. With this, we're just told that she has feelings. It's not built to me. It doesn't feel built up enough for for it. But all in all, season three is just forgettable, except for the 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 last few episodes, really. And it sucks because you know I definitely did enjoy my rewatch of season three because. In the past, I used to always rank series three down at the near, essentially near the bottom. If I was to rate uh, back then, when I used to, if I was to rate all the the seasons, uh, but now, you know, it's a good season, but very forgettable. So it, 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 again, it would rank lower if I was to do a complete series one to thirteen ranking. It would definitely rank at, towards the bottom. You know, and uh, it'd be definitely above the Jodie Whittaker era. That's that's for sure. Uh, which I did do a video on last year. If you want to go check it out, but um, yeah, it's it's good but forgettable. That's the only downfall that it has. But there you guys go. I don't know how long this this video has been, so because I I haven't scripted it, and I, I have yet to edit it all all together. So thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all next month for another Doctor Who series review when I review series four. And I ask the question, is series four of Doctor Who overrated? Because I haven't watched it in full since uh, since it first aired. And there's, uh, like, there's episodes in there that I haven't seen since it first came out. So yeah, it's going to be a controversial uh, video, but I'm looking forward to it. I'll see you all next time.